If you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and then I'm going to go to our text for today in Hebrews chapter 5. But I want to lay the foundation properly because some of you have been here and some of you have not, so I don't believe we should just jump right in without bringing you up to speed how we've gotten to where we are. So if you have your Bibles, please stand with us one more time and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read verse 1, and then I will go to Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 reads as follows. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now turn to chapter 5. Verse 11 through 14, which reads as follows. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You may be seated. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to stand before the people of God with the word of God. We have sung songs of praise and thanksgiving and honor to you. We have given back to you in recognition that you have first given to us. In recognition that you have given us more importantly than things. You've given us life. And life more abundantly. Not because it didn't cost you, it did cost you. For you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in human flesh to die on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. And then you raised him up on the third day and he ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he now sits at the right hand of the Father as an intercessor, a high priest, interceding on our behalf. And we say thank you. And we want to just take a glimpse at this priest, this high priest. And having glimpsed at him, may we learn to gaze at him. And as we gaze at him, may we be transformed into his image. By your grace, by your mercy, by your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We read for you Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and we've kind of used that as a springboard to look at this idea of saving faith and living faith. You see, those who are not saved need saving faith. Those who are saved need to live out their faith. So whether you are a sinner who needs to be saved, you need saving faith. And if you are a believer, a saint who has been saved, you need to ask the question, are you living out your faith in a way that is clear and seeable and in line with the word of God? And we've been dealing with this subject of the enemies of courage because we've been breaking it down and looking at each point very slowly, and I want to continue to do that. I may be a little more teachy than what you're used to this morning, but I am a preacher who teaches, and I am a teacher who preaches, so it all goes together for me. But we live in a world, in the world of Christianum, churchiness, if you will, where there is the same problem that we find in the book of Hebrews. You see, we've been dealing with, and we've said to you, that there are those who have heard the gospel, Jews, particularly in this tech context, but also Gentiles, who have heard the gospel, who have heard Jesus, 
who have heard the apostles, who have heard the prophets, who have been hearing pastors teach about faith and the need to be born again, the need to have new life, the need to inherit eternal life. And the Holy Spirit has done his work in their hearts. He has turned the light on, so to speak, because they were dead in sins and trespasses. They had no life eternally, but they've heard the gospel and the Holy Spirit has illuminated them the truth about Jesus Christ, but they have refused to act on it because of unbelief. And our churches today are filled with people who are unbelieving believers. Now, that may sound a little contradictory, but it's true. There are Jews who hear the truth in this context, have heard the truth, who have understood the truth, who have been illuminated by the Holy Spirit about the truth, but have chosen not to respond to the truth because of unbelief. But there are also on the flip side, as we will see next week when we deal with chapter 6, 1 through 8, which really deals with believers. This text deals with unbelievers. There are people in the church who are unbelieving believers. And if you are an unbelieving believer, you may not be saved or you may not be trusting God in how you live. And it's all about, do you do what you hear? You see, this text talks about dullness of hearing. Here's my question to you this morning. Are you guilty of being dull in your hearing? Now, before you answer that too quick, here's the dilemma. If you have dullness of hearing, how do you know you're dull? If you do not have the ability to hear, and the way that you can test whether you have the ability to hear is that do you do what you hear from the word of God? Because if you sit Sunday after Sunday, Bible study after Bible study, devotion after devotion, sermon after sermon, and don't do what you hear. You are very likely guilty of dullness of hearing. Now, it's not that you don't hear with your physical ears. You don't hear with your spiritual ears. You see, the Bible wants us not just to hear what God says, the Bible wants us to do what God says. Now, I don't have time, and I won't bore you with all the statistics. You can go on Barner's research, and you can go on Pew Research and do the research, but the statistics are saying that our churches are filled with people who are unbelieving believers. Over 50% of the people who claim to be Christians do not believe that the word of God is the word of God. 50% or more. They believe some of it's the word of God and some of it is not the word of God. And then they get to determine which is which and which is not which. Over 50% of people who claim to be Christians do not believe that Jesus is the only means of salvation. Let, let that sink in for a minute. Over 50% do not believe that Jesus is the only way. They believe that God can work through other religions or other means. That you don't have to come and believe that Jesus is the only way to life and the only way to God. Our churches are full of unbelieving believers. Our churches are full of people as a result of the epidemic of, of COVID who don't believe you need to go to church anymore. Unbelieving believers, they profess to be believers, but they're really unbelievers professing to be something they're really not. 
And this is a result, I believe, of the first two that we've talked about as the enemies of courageous faith, drifting away and hardening of the heart. But I think the biggest culprit is this dullness of hearing. Now, you guys know me. I'm, I'm pretty studious. I went and got my uh, thesaurus out, and I looked the word dull and dullness up to see what other synonyms would communicate what dullness is. I'm not going to share them to you, with you because they would insult most of you. So like Alistair Begg says, you guys are intelligent people, you have thesauruses, you can go look at the world dull and dullness and let the thesaurus offend you because I don't want to offend you this morning. But you will not like the other words that communicate what dull or dullness is. But I will communicate this morning that like in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, 11 through 14, the church is filled with people who are dull of hearing. I came across this, this statement on Facebook, and I thought it was appropriate for where we're going this morning. The statement says this, we are drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. Let that sink in. We are in a culture, a generation, where we have more information than your brain can handle. But we have more foolishness going on. More foolish decisions being made than any generation, probably since the beginning of time. We are drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. And in the church, I believe, based on the word of God, that it's because we have too many people who have become and are becoming dull of hearing. It has nothing to do with the communicator. It has everything to do with what you are inwardly and what you may not be inwardly. It has nothing to do with the skill of the communicator. It has everything to do with whether you have life eternally or life just outside of yourself. A lot of walking zombies in our culture today. Dead men walking. And they go to church. The word dull reflects the people's spiritual lethargy and slow response to gospel teaching, which hinders additional teaching at the time. The reason why we can't take people deeper into the scriptures is because they have become so dull of hearing, all they can deal with is the ABCs. The purpose of learning the ABCs is so you can form words. And the reason you form words is so that you can form sentences. And the reason you form sentences is so you can make paragraphs. And the reason you make paragraphs is so that you can have chapters. And the reason you have chapters is so that you can have books. But if all you do is just stay A, B, C, don't be surprised Johnny can't read. But when you stay A, B, C spiritually, there is no maturity, and you cannot handle the mature things of God. See, you got to move off death, burial, and resurrection. That's ABC. But in this context, for the Hebrews who were Jews, the ABCs was the law. And they refused to move up off the law and the ceremonial laws and the dietary laws and come to Christ. Because Christ is maturity, the other things are immaturity. Oh, I wish somebody was praying with me this morning. Amen. Amen. There's nothing new under the sun. We got too many ABC people in the church. And when you begin to dig into the scriptures and get to the death and breath and of the scriptures and the width of the scriptures, they get lost. They start to nod. Their minds start to drift. 
Because now you're moving from ABC to forming words to forming... We're talking about progressive growth. And when people don't grow, they don't grow, according to the writer of Hebrews, because they have become dull of hearing. You see, that's the problem here in this text. Let me, let me get you to the text. We read for you Hebrews chapter 5 in the congregational reading. We, we did that on purpose because... The writer of Hebrews says, I want to talk to you about the priesthood of Melchizedek. But I can't talk to you about the priesthood of Melchizedek because you don't understand the basic things. What he's saying is, I want to take you into some deeper waters. I want to take you into some deeper territory, but I can't do that because you're still immature. Are, are y'all with me this morning? He says, according, verse 10, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, speaking about Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about earlier in chapter 5. But verse 11 says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. We can't take people deeper in the scriptures because they have become dull, lethargic, apathetic in their hearing. They're not applying the basics, so you can't take them deeper. And if you don't go deeper, you don't mature. And our churches are full of people who are not maturing. Things they should have gotten over a long time ago after hearing all the scriptures and all the sermons and all the Bible studies and all the devotions and all the songs and they still act like children, babes, someone just coming out the womb. And you know what babies are like when they come out the womb. They spit up on you. You try to feed them, and when you feed them, they spit out what you try to feed them. They're not able yet to control certain functions of their body. I don't want to get too deep on you. So they need someone who is mature to change their physical diapers. Do you know that there are spiritual diapers you got to be changing in the church? Because people are not maturing, they're not growing. They're not advancing because they're dull of hearing. Listen, you should always ask this question. What is it that God wants me to do with what he just said through the preacher? And make a commitment of that before you even go out the door. Now, any good preaching is going to tell you not only what the text means, but what you need to do with the text before you leave. But everything won't apply to you, but there's something that should apply to you. And it's the Holy Spirit job to say, that's you. This one's for you. This is where you need to work at. I may not know that. I don't have to know that. The Holy Spirit, who is responsible for illuminating to you and convincing you and convicting you, should be knocking on the tablets of your heart and on your brain and saying, hey, that one is you. But if you dull a hearing, he can knock from here to doomsday. You won't respond. It's a sad thing to go to people's house and push the doorbell and get mad because they don't answer because you didn't know the doorbell don't work. And Sunday after Sunday, people come into the sanctuary, the household of God, and hear truth about God. But you don't see any change. You don't see sin falling off and holiness being added on. It's because they got a doorbell that don't work. And as a pastor and as a disciple maker, if you don't understand what it's supposed to look like, people will fool you by their church attendance. See, some of you believe, and some people who are listening to us online believe, if I just show up, 
that's enough. No, no, no. Remember, God wants to transform you into the image of Christ. And you don't get that by just showing up. Because if you're drifting away, if you have a hard heart, if you have become dull of hearing, showing up is not enough. Talk to me, pews. These are informed people, but unbelieving Jews who are not focused. They have refused to believe in Jesus. They have refused to believe Moses, which represents the law. They refuse to believe Joshua, which represents conquering the promised land. They have refused to leave angel worship. They have refused to leave the ceremonial laws and the dietary laws, which all point you to Christ and come to Christ, which is maturity. Thank you, my sister. At least one is listening. What is it that you have refused to leave and come to Christ? Who is it that you have refused to leave and come to Christ? What in this material world is that you have refused to leave and come to Christ? Well, Pastor, I've come to Christ. I just got some other stuff. Then you haven't left. Because it's Christ alone who is the author of our salvation Amen. and the finisher of our salvation, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, verse 2. You can't have Buddha and Jesus. You can't have Confucius and Jesus. You can't have Patrick Mahone and Jesus. You can't have yourself. And Jesus. Amen. And until you get rid of your unbelief and place all of your weight of your trust in Jesus alone, you are in danger of drifting, you are in danger of developing a hard heart, and you are in danger of dullness of hearing. Anybody remember that old show, Lost in Space? Y'all yeah. remember the robot? Yeah. Whenever Will Robinson would get in trouble, if there was any danger around, he would say, danger, danger. <laughs> I'm trying to be the robot for you this morning. Danger, danger. Some of you are in danger of being dull of hearing. But like Dr. Smith, y'all don't believe the robot. And you keep getting in problems and mess and trouble time after time. Because really, you don't believe. You are an unbelieving, professing believer. But you are not a possessor of belief. It's not even good enough to be a professor of belief. You must be a possessor of belief. Are y'all with me still? So I want to share two aspects with you, and then we'll get you out of here. The first one, there are three eternal facts of dullness of hearing. Three eternal facts of dullness of hearing. Let me give them to you, and then we'll move on. This text in verse 12 says, For though by this time, People been in church all their lives, still acting immature and like little kids. Hearing sermon after sermon, 52 sermons a year, doing devotions and reading Bible study and coming to Wednesday night, and they still are no better than little babies or children in their spiritual walk. Why is that? Because either they have drifted away from Christ, they have become hard in their heart towards Christ, or they become dull of hearing about Christ. See, this is why many people go to church and don't even have to hear anything about Christ because they're not interested in Christ. And many of our churches are Christless. 
or very immature in their view of Christ. So what are these three eternal facts of dullness of hearing? Number one, this is a reminder that failure to apply the truth of the gospel produces stagnation in spiritual advancement and growth. When you don't apply what you hear, you will always end up in stagnation and regression in your spiritual growth. Hello? Is anybody hearing me? When you don't do anything with all the messages you hear, when you don't do anything with the Bible studies you do, when you don't do anything with the truth you hear week after week, day after day, you will stagnate and you will regress. And the Christian life is not a regressing life, it's an advancing life. You are complete in Christ positionally, but you're becoming more and more like Christ practically. But if you haven't been positioned in Christ, don't be surprised you're not advancing in Christ practically. You see, these Jews in this text know what they need to know. Why? Because they heard Christ, they heard the apostles, they have the word of God, but they don't understand that we're supposed to make a transition from the old to the new. That we make a transition from the old covenant to the new covenant, and the old covenant was the law and Moses and the ceremonial laws and the dietary laws, but the new is Christ because all of those were types that pointed you to the reality of Christ. So if I really understood what those types were all about, when the real shows up, I should leave the types and come to the real. And the real is Christ. But they did not believe in Christ. They rejected Christ. The Jews as a nation crucified them on the cross. Now how is it that you've been listening to the Old Testament And the Old Testament talks about where the Messiah would be born, what he would do, how he would be born. And when he shows up, you don't recognize him when he shows up. Now, slow your roll. Don't get it twisted. Don't be thinking, if I had been back there back then, I would have believed. Because you're here today and got more information than they got, and you still don't believe. They had the Old Testament. We got the old, the new. Jesus has come. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell us and to fill us, and we still got people who don't believe. And why are we so shocked that sinners refuse to listen to our message about the gospel? As if the first time you heard it, you responded. How many times did you have to hear it before you responded? How many times did you have to hear it before you responded and took it seriously? How many times did you have to hear it before you responded, took it seriously, and started living it? But you think if you had been back, you, look at these crazy folk, these Jews. I don't get how they saw Jesus and saw all the miracles and, saw, and, and, they, didn't, and they didn't believe. The same way you don't believe today. The same way when trials and troubles and tribulations come into your life, you abandon Jesus. Poking your lips out. Being depressed. Don't want to come to church. Don't want to read my Bible anymore. See, I want to be saved. Just don't be testing me, Jesus. Let me say I'm saved. Don't ever test me to see what what I say matches up with what you said. Well, that's not Christianity. It's got to be tested. Any good teacher only tests the student on material they're supposed to know the information. 
But no, church has become like the school system. Kids come to school and don't want to be tested. Just give me the information. Let me decide what I like and what I don't like. And I'll let you know. I show up when I want to show up. I don't show up if I don't want to show up. I'll pay attention if I want to pay attention. I won't pay attention if I don't want to pay attention. That sounds like church folk. But then you got the nerve to give me a test like I'm supposed to remember everything you said? Listen, the Bible says the genuineness of your faith must be tested to see whether it's real gold or fool's gold. Because they both can look alike. But only the trained eye can tell the difference. Secondly, it also creates an inability to understand or assimilate additional truth that is taught. He wanted to teach them about the priesthood of Melchizedek, which Christ's priesthood was a reflection of. But he says, I can't do that because you become, in verse 11, dull of hearing. I can't take you into deep waters because you aren't even swimming well in shallow waters. Do you know people just like to stay on the surface of this Christianity thing? I like to be churchy. I ain't really serious about being Christian. Yeah, I like going to church, but all that loving my brother and loving my sister and loving my enemy and loving God first, I'm not quite with that but I'm a Christian. Look at Romans. Let's do a little Bible reading. Romans chapter 1. Hold your finger here and coming back. Go to Romans chapter 1. Verse 18 to 20. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, in order to suppress truth, that means truth has to be illuminated. You, you ever have kids, you be trying to tell them something, and they stick their fingers in their ear, and they start trying to yell you louder than you do, so they suppress what you're trying to say? Do you know that this world is trying to suppress the truth that God is revealing to you and illuminating in your life? And we're all caught up in the world, and we can't hear the word of God any longer. Because we're loving and lusting and longing after the same things that unsaved people are lusting and longing after. And Satan develops different denominations who want to promise you what you're longing and lusting after. And make that the Christian life. And because you're not growing, you don't have enough discernment to know what's good and what's evil. What's better and what's best. Listen to this. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Everybody knows God exists. But they suppress what they know. Through natural revelation, through creation, God has what? Made himself known. And everybody inwardly that has ever been born understands there is a God. They may not know specifically who this God is, but they know there's God. Come close. Everybody worships. The problem is, what is the object of your worship? Everybody worships. You don't really need to teach people how to worship. We've talked about this phone thing. People are worshiping food and worshiping themselves because all they do is take selfies of themselves. They don't ever take no selfies of God. And God gave you a selfie of himself 
in the person of Jesus Christ. So you know what God is like by studying the life and person and work of Christ. Because Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 says, he is the exact copy and image of his father. And yet we have Jews who say they believe in God, but we don't believe that Jesus is the son of God. Are, are y'all with me? Because everybody knows God exists, but when they suppress the truth and become dull of hearing, they begin to worship the created rather than the creator because everybody was born with a nature to worship. That's why we worship things. Because we know there's something in us that drives us to worship. The problem is too many people got the wrong object of worship. It's not that they don't know they should worship. It's not that they don't know how to worship. They don't know the right object to worship. But everybody worships. Don't get it twisted. And so they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For since the creation of the world, verse 20, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his internal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Jesus says this in John 16, 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus had a lot of things he wanted to teach his disciples, but because they weren't maturing, he couldn't take them where he wanted them to go. There's more to know, but I can't share the more with you because you haven't even captured and understood the basic I've tried to share with you. Now they got it when the Holy Spirit came. But while they were with Jesus, Jesus, there's a lot of things I'm going to teach you that I can't teach you right now because you haven't moved off the ABCs yet. Hold your finger here. We're coming back to Hebrews. Don't worry. Go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. This was a problem during Jesus' time. It's not a new problem. It's an old problem that has present reality. Look at chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 14. And in them, the prophecy of the Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. You hear with your physical ears, but you don't understand the spiritual implications. You don't get the biblical understanding or meaning. And seeing, you will see and not perceive. You will see me, but not really perceive who I am. For the hearts of this people have grown what? What your Bible say? Dull. Dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should, be, should understand with their hearts and turn. See, that's when you know you're getting it. That's when you know the light is on. You hear the word of God, see you're going the wrong way, and you turn and go the right way. You see that you're living contrary to the scriptures. You see that you're living contrary to the glory of God. You see that you're living contrary to the life of the disciple, and you turn when you really hear and when you really see. See, that's why you need to be born again. Because you're dead in sins and trespasses. You have no spiritual life. And people come and they're unbelieving believers, meaning they have not been born again. They have not trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin. They hear the words, but it doesn't make any sense. It seems too difficult. It seems too hard. It seems impossible. That's because they're dead. Oh, but when you get life. 
You can now hear what you couldn't hear before. You can now see and perceive what you couldn't see and perceive before. And now you understand you need to what? Turn. If you come here Sunday after Sunday and Bible study after Bible study and hear the word of God and there's no turning, that's probably because you dull of hearing. Well, he didn't put it in a way where I could understand it. Listen, let me tell you something. Every pastor messes up the word of God. But the Holy Spirit tra- straightens out the mess. I shoot bullets, God turns it into buckshot and hits you exactly where you need to be hit. It is the spirit that illuminates the truth. And the first truth the Holy Spirit wants to illuminate, you need to be born again. Because we can't go deeper in the deeper things of God if you don't even have the ABC of new life. You ain't sleeping because you're tired. You're sleeping because you're dull of hearing. Your mind ain't drifting because you got too many things going on. Your mind is drifting because you're dull of hearing. And you ended up drifting. Your heart got hard, and now your ears can't hear, spiritually speaking. And it's not the pastor's fault. Because no matter how inadequate the pastor is, and we're all inadequate, the Holy Spirit always does what the Holy Spirit can do. He illuminates. He turns on the light. He helps you to perceive and understand. Now, we need to be as clear as possible as we can be. And we try to, my job is to put it on the shelf where everybody can get it. But I can do all that and you still not get it. Because preaching and teaching and reading the word of God is a partnership between the reader, the preacher, the hearer, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all with me still? Thirdly, under the three eternal facts of dullness of hearing, rejection of God's revelation of scripture results in the process of hardening of the hearts. Hey, 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 that's why we got to teach you the word of God. We got to teach you the word of God. We, we're not up here giving speeches. I am not a speecher. I'm a preacher. Amen. Amen. My job is to herald, to proclaim the word of God, to expose, to pull out of the text the meaning and communicate that meaning to you. But it's the Holy Spirit's job to drive it home to your heart. But there's some things you got to be doing so you don't hinder the work of the Spirit in your life. You got to make sure you're not drifting away. You got to make sure your heart's not getting hard towards God and the things of God. And you got to make sure you don't become dull of hearing. Turn to Romans one more time 1 21 to 32. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 to 32. I'm just trying to give you verses that help you to understand, to give some concrete to what we're saying. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, when you reject the truth of God, when you reject the truth about Jesus Christ, you go down, you don't go up. You go backwards, you don't go forward. But most churches are in a drought when it comes to the word of God. And look what happens when people do this. Verse 20, professing to be wise, they became fools. Our world thinks we are wise. People in America think they are the smartest people on God's green earth and the biggest fools. So much foolishness going on. So many foolish decisions being made. So many foolish choices being chosen. See, when you reject God, it doesn't surprise me, nor should it surprise you, you can't figure out genders. (laughs) 
that you come up with new genders different than what the Bible has. When you reject the truth of God, it doesn't surprise me. We can't solve the racial division in the country, let alone the church, when you reject God because we're foolish. Doesn't shock me that people in the church don't know whether abortion is a sin or not. Pro-choice, pro-life. Ain't but one choice, life. Because we understand we serve a sovereign God that no matter how that conception came about, God values that life and he can do something with that life that we can't even see right now. And what do they do? Verse 23, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. People go and worship. But when you reject God's truth, you end up worshiping the create creation rather than the creator. It surprised me that people don't want second services on Sunday. Uh-oh. They got other things they worship. And there's good things you can choose to do. But is it the best thing? Do that on your time with other stuff. But let the Lord's day be the Lord's day. This leads us to our second point under this main point, the enemy known as dullness of hearing. Five essential features of dullness of hearing. And I'll just run through these real quick because I think they're very obvious from the text. Look at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Listen. Dullness of hearing creates a lack of teachers. He says by this time, You've been around long enough. You've heard enough about Jesus. You've heard enough about God. You've heard enough from the apostles. You've heard enough from the prophets. You've heard enough from your pastor that by this time, you ought to be teachers. You know why you needed to get saved and you can't teach somebody else why they need to get saved? You know where to get living water and you can't tell somebody else where to go get living water? You've received the bread of life, and you can't tell other people where to go get the bread of life? You understand what your most important need is. You can't witness to other people and help them understand what their most important need is. You see, if you don't understand why it's Jesus alone, how do you tell somebody else why it's Jesus alone? If you're not trusting Jesus for saving faith and you're not trusting Jesus in living faith, how do you tell somebody else how to be saved by faith and how to live out their faith? By this time, you ought to be teachers. You shouldn't still be babies. You shouldn't still be children. You should be maturing. Who do babies teach? You ever thought about that? Now, some babies teach their parents because their parents are still babies. See, we live in a culture where the children run the parents. And we have churches full of pastors who are no more than children and babes trying to teach people who don't live what the Bible says for themselves, but don't have a problem standing before people saying what the Bible says, if they do that. No, no, no. Every believer should be a teacher on some level when it comes to the truth or the witness of the gospel of salvation. You don't need no evangelism class. You need to be saved. 
And if you know why you need to get saved, an evangelism class or workshop can enhance that, but you should need that to be going and teaching others what they need to do and why they need to get saved. Oh, I got quiet on that one. Listen, we don't witness, and the modern-day church does not witness. We are not going out and winning lost people. We got people transferring churches and rotating churches, but we're not winning the loss. And we're not winning the loss because Acts 1 8 says you had not received power. Because Acts 1 8 says, when you receive power, you shall be my witnesses. In other words, you're not filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus told the disciples in John 15 and John 16, when he comes, he will speak about me. Well, if the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will speak about him, and on the day of Pentecost in Acts 1-8, when the Holy Spirit came into their lives, if he's filling you, guess what you're going to be doing? Speaking about Jesus. I'm scared. That's why you got power. See, tell me you cold. And if I tell you go stick your finger in that electrical socket, don't do it, though. But if I tell you, you won't be cold long. That socket will light you up. Know why it will light you up? It's got power. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you may be fearful. You may be scared. You may be fearful of rejection. You may be fearful of persecution. But when you have power, you shall be a witness. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world. The modern day church is not witnessing because it lacks power. And it lacks power because it is not dependent upon the truth and faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, the second essential feature of dullness of hearing dullness of hearing creates spiritual immaturity. He says in the latter part of verse 12, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Babies need milk. They're born designed to want what? How do you know they're born and designed by God to want milk? Because he puts something in the mother that wasn't in the mother before she got pregnant to have a baby. But we go on and feed them Similac, Kool-Aid, and Pepsi. God said they need milk. How do you know they need milk? Because God put milk in the mother. And people need the word of God, and we're feeding them Similac, Pepsi, Diet Coke, And then wondering why he got problems later on down the line. Is anybody with me this morning? Have I lost you already? Can I get you back? See, you're going to listen to all these other excuses by these other preachers and these other churches. I'm trying to tell you what the real deal is. And I know some of you, well, why your truth got to be the truth? It's not my truth, this is truth. We aren't the first generation that Dolans are hearing what's the problem for. And we won't be the last. Information without application and obedience does not advance us into maturity. Listen. God is not just giving information to give information. He wants you to do something with the information. So hearing in the Bible, the word hearing in the Greek means to hear with the intention of doing what you hear. Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 when he talks about the two houses that are being built. And the only difference in the scenario, you can check me out when you go home, is one did what he heard and the other one didn't. 
That's the only difference. Everything else in the text is the same about the two individuals. But the life that stands, and that's what the house is the picture of, the life that stands when the winds and the storms and the rains and the flood and trials and temptation come is the one that's built on the word of God. The one that's built on sin, worldview, world opinion, I feel, I think, they say, collapses. Do you know that people don't want to hear the word of God preached in church? Give me a song, a dance, a twist, and a flip, and let's go. <laughs> Give me a TED talk. No offense, TED. A TED talk. Let's just have a conversation. Don't preach the word like it's authoritative. Don't preach the word like it's what God says and your opinion don't matter. People don't like those kind of churches. Because they're unbelieving believers. But anybody that's truly been born again, anybody that's got their faith in Christ, anyone that the Holy Spirit is working in, hungers and thirsts like a newborn babe, First Peter says, for the word of God. Amen. Pastor, I, I, I'm having trouble. I'm struggling. I just don't feel like reading my Bible. I can tell you why you don't feel like reading your Bible. You ain't in love. See, those of us who've been in love know what it is to be in love. See, some of y'all been in lust, but you ain't been in love. There is a difference. How, how do you not want to read a love letter that was written to you from God? This is his letter to us. It tells us how to love him, how to worship him, how not to love him, how not to worship him, how to please him, how not how to offend him. It's his story written to us so we can know him and we can know about us. Amen. And you don't want to read about that? You you rather watch fake stories on television? The bachelor and the bachelorette, and in my Bible, that's, that's, that's hoarding them. That's, that's, that's sexual immorality, and you watching it like entertainment. Survivor Series. Sports. Now, I, I watch the Chiefs. They don't own me. I get around to them when I got time. I don't set my life by the Chiefs. Some of y'all, hurry up, Pastor. Pastor Mahomes and Bishop Reed going to be on soon. Now, I'm not going down to Airhead Baptist Fellowship, but I got it DVR'd. I got, I'm going to watch it virtually. Then Monday you want to call me because they lost and you need counseling. Sports dominates people. They set their lives by it. Their moods are changed by how the team did or didn't do. But God doesn't affect them that way one iota. They can critique everything that's going on in the field, but when it comes to their own life, no critique. You better not miss a pass. You better not miss a catch. You better not miss a run. You better not miss a tackle. But when it comes to sin in my life, I'm only human. Ain't nobody perfect. You didn't say that when you was worshiping at Arrowhead Baptist Fellowship. The inability to discern good from evil, best, better from best, is lacking. Because of spiritual immaturity. It tends to generate people unex inexperienced, unskilled, and therefore unprepared and incapable in believing in or reflecting Christ in their life. 
Thirdly, dullness of hearing confuses the hearer on the message of righteousness. Turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. Galatians chapter 3. The Jews had this problem. It's still a problem in this text, and it's a problem today. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22 and following reads this way. But the scripture has confined all under sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. The whole time, the purpose of the law is to drive you to Christ. They want to hang on to the law and reject Christ. No, Christ is what the law is about. It shows you you aren't righteous. It shows you that what God says about you is that you are a sinner, that you are born in sin, shaped in iniquity by your very nature. It can't save you, but Christ can. But you want to hang on to what can't save you and reject Christ. People need Christ. They don't need rules and regulations. Listen. Listen. If you get Christ right, you'll do the rules and regulations. You can do the rules and regulations and miss Christ. See, they have speed limit signs because they know that Christians don't drive in the spirit. So they need laws. If you drove in the spirit, you wouldn't need the sign because you would drive according to what the sign requires. I got a lead foot. Do you got a born again foot? <laughs> Stop presenting your members to unrighteousness. Romans chapter 6 says. But he says here, he, he wants us to understand in verse 22 and following in chapter 3 that we, that we got to make some changes in Galatians. The scriptures, the law is designed to point you to Christ. The righteousness is not found in the law because you can't keep the law. So you need someone who has kept the law on your behalf. And the only one who's kept the law perfectly is Jesus Christ. Come to Christ. Don't try to depend on the law. For he is our righteousness. Fourthly, dullness of hearing robs the hearer of salvation, verse 14. Robs the hearer of salvation. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, maturity. That is those who by reason. See, when you begin to mature in Christ, you no longer pursue the things of this world. You no longer set your agenda and your values and your priorities by the things of this world. Christ becomes your all in all. But dullness of hearing robs you of your salvation. This refers to the completion or perfection which comes when someone becomes a believer in Christ rather than referring to a Christian who has become mature. People need to come to Christ for salvation. But they will never come to Christ if we don't hold Christ up. If we don't understand why Christ is the only way. Where Acts says there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. There are no other options. There's no other way. And don't be shocked because they resist that. They're dull of hearing. They don't have life. Unless the Holy Spirit is working in them, they'll never receive what you're saying. But that don't matter. Your job and my job is just to be a witness. See, this is why you got to die to self. Because if you don't die to self, how they respond to you will keep you, make you keep your mouth shut. I don't want to force Christ on them. Go to the graveyard, try to force Christ on people, see how it works. 
They're dead in sins and trespasses. They're separated from God. They have no awareness of God and their need for God unless we tell them the good news. But good news isn't good news until you understand the bad news. Finally, dullness of hearing manifests in lack of discernment. He says in the latter part of verse 14, and I close with this, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Do you have discernment? John MacArthur says one of the greatest aspects of the Christian life that's missing in the church is discernment. We no longer know good from evil, right from wrong, up from down, left from right. Because there are those who are teaching there's no such thing as absolute truth. And whenever someone tells you there's no absolute truth, here's your response. Are you absolutely sure? Because that statement is a statement of absolute. Brothers and sisters, there is absolute truth. And if you hear truth Sunday after Sunday, Bible study after Bible study, Wednesday after Wednesday, devotion after devotion, and you don't do anything with it, you are on the path of dullness of hearing. It always amazes me how people hear better for other people than they do for themselves. It just amazes me. Oh, pastor, they needed that one. Well, what did you need? Ooh, I wish they were here. They needed to hear that. Well, you was here. What did you get? They hear so much better for other people and don't hear well for themselves. That is evidence of dullness of hearing. If you sit and hear the word of God being preached, and you're thinking about everybody else that it applies to, and you don't apply anything to you, you are on the path of dullness of hearing. And it may be because you have the other two symptoms we've already talked about, a hardened heart, and you've drifted away from the harbor that is Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to drift. I don't ever want your hearts to get hard, and I don't ever want you to become dull of hearing. But I can't live your Christian life for you. I can only live my Christian life for me as an example to you. And every sermon, I have to deal with it all week. And I have to ask questions for myself. That's why I'm so good about asking questions about you. Because I've had to deal with it for me first before I've had to preach it to you. And all of us should have that same response if we're hearing with the attention of doing what God has said. Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We know that Israel as a nation became so dull that they didn't even recognize the Messiah when he showed up. But even here in the book of Hebrews, after hearing Jesus and seeing Jesus, after hearing the apostles and seeing the apostles, after hearing the prophets, and seeing the prophets, we still find people who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, who refuse to leave the old to come to the new when the purpose of the old was to drive you and guide you to the new, the perfect, who is Christ. I pray, Father, that there may be some in my hearing who may be like these unbelieving Jews, been in church all their lives, have heard scripture after scripture, sermon after sermon, but don't do anything with what they hear. Or they do it sometimes, but not other times. Father, I pray for you to illuminate to them where they are and what they need to do to turn. Not tomorrow, but today. Tomorrow is not promised to you, but we can start today. Thank you for our guests that are here this morning. Thank you for our brothers and sisters that are here. We pray that they have heard from you and sensed your presence. Glorify yourself in their lives. 
be with us as we go our separate ways. Bring us back together again to worship you in spirit and truth. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Let every heart say, amen. God bless.